encourage you to open your Bibles to the scripture that I had the honor and privilege to read earlier, Luke chapter 14, and it's verses 7 to 24. Luke chapter 14, verses 17, uh, 7 to 24. And I want to kind of set the stage here a little bit, if I may. Jesus is at a dinner, he's at a banquet, and, while, and we'll call it a banquet. And while he's at this banquet, he takes opportunity to address or speak to the guest. The guests that are present at this banquet because he sees them and, and something in their behavior and what they're doing that, to use a word of today, that tips his head as to the conditions of their hearts. And he talks to them about something that is very, very important. And it's the issue of humility. Okay? And then after speaking to them, the next person that he speaks to, he, he turns to the host of the banquet. The person who's given the banquet and he sees the guest list of, of something that tempts his head again. Or tempts him off as to what the person who is given the party really wants. And what he really wants to get out of this banquet. And the Lord speaks to him about something that's very important too. And it's the issue of being generous as opposed to being selfish. It's the issue of being selfless instead of being self-preoccupied. Then, of course, in our text, we have someone in the banquet. In an awkward moment of conversation, blurts out a saying that in and of itself is true. But it's a saying which indicates the person who said it was a little nervous because of what Jesus has just been saying. Because Jesus said something at this banquet, both to the guest and to the host, that was pretty bold. You could probably even call it Countercultural. Now, beloved, we've heard that word, haven't we? Countercultural. And just to help, let me give a, a because I, I knew what it meant in my head, but I wanted to put it down in writing. So I looked it up to see a little simple meaning. And countercultural means a way of life or a set of attitudes opposed to the current social way of thinking. Okay? So let me give you an example. All right? Culture says that there's a couple hundred, or maybe just hundreds, of genders. I say, and I say it because I read it in the Bible, that there's only two genders. Male, and female. God has made you either male or female. Nothing in between. And let me say this lovingly. You may not like that you're a woman. Or you may not like that you're a man. But it's the gender that God made you. And God doesn't make mistakes. And I don't care how many operations you have. You're not going to correct it in God's eyes. Because when God wove you and created you and formed you in your mother's womb, he did you as a male or a female. Amen? Culture says that there are many ways to heaven. I say, and I say this because the Bible says this, there is only one way to heaven. One way to God, and that is through His Son, Jesus Christ, and Him alone. And let me, again, I say this lovingly. I don't say it out of a, a hard heart, a mean heart, a being mean-spirited, or, or anything else. I say it lovingly. 
If you're one of those people who believe that there are many ways to heaven, one day, my dear friend, you're going to discover that you were wrong and that the word of Jesus Christ in the Bible is correct and it's too late. Culture says that that growth in some mama's bellies is just a blob of tissue. And can be murdered, and that's what it is. Let's not play silly little games and call it authorited. No, it's murdered. At any time. I say to you because the word of God says that that growth in mama's bellies is a human who's just a wee bit littler than you and I. And I say to you because the Bible says... That life begins at the moment of conception. Not when you bring the baby home. Or not when you just hold it for the first time. And you didn't know that you were going to come this morning and have a biology lesson. But here we go. And I say this respectfully. When that egg and that sperm comes together, that's life. And I say it's life because God says it's life. Now, if you agree with me because of what the Word of God says, and you think and believe that you are countercultural to a lost society in which we live, and I'll wear that on my coat as a badge. Because I'm going to stand with the Word of God. And we all should. So what Jesus said at this banquet, this party, this dinner was countercultural to what a typical Jewish person would say to their host or to the people there. Also, what the guests say is contrary to the normal behavior of parties and and, and, and there was an awkward silence. And then you got this person, I don't know who, doesn't matter who. He says this to, it, this to Jesus that we read earlier. You can read it in the text. And in response to that saying, Jesus directs their attention to a greater and more important a banquet than the banquet that they're at right now. And that's going to be the banquet. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb that God himself is going to give at the end of times. I would rather be at that banquet than any banquet there is on the face of this earth. Because if I'm at that banquet, that means I'm one of his. So... Beloved, Jesus is drawing them and he's drawing you and I this morning in our text in Luke 14 to think about who is going to be at that final banquet. And not just who is going to be there, am I going to be there? So this morning I'm going to share with you three things from Luke 14. Number one in your outline, Jesus calls his disciples to develop habits of humility. Look at verse 1. Luke writes, at the, he began speaking a parable. Way a reminder. A parable is an earthly story that shows a heavenly reality. Basic and simple. In seven, verses 7 through 11, Jesus calls his disciples on purpose to develop habits of humility, doesn't he? Now, beloved, it's interesting. While the Lord is at this banquet, he, he's looking around. I love this. He's looking around, and, and, and he's noticing how these people are jockeying themselves for the most important seat, right? And, and we've all known something of this, haven't we? Most of us, I would say, has been to some kind of party, some kind of dinner. 
And there are certain people there or persons there who maybe they're the keynote speaker and, and they're kind of important. And you see everyone, including yourself maybe, jockeying to get that table to be the closest to that person, whoever he or she may be. Maybe they're a famous political figure, or maybe they're a, a well-known Christian leader. And you and I are jockeying around to see if we could get to that right table where we're going to be closest, that in case he or she comes down off the platform, we can extend our hands and we can shake hands with that person. And that's what Jesus is observing at this banquet. Now, look at verse 7 of our text. And he begins speaking a parable to, to the invited guest when he noticed how they were picking out the places of honor at the table. Okay? Then now, look, drop your eyes down to verse 11. And let's see how Jesus ends his words to them. In verse 11, he says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Oh, my goodness. That's an important statement of Jesus because humility and the need to develop habits of humility is important if you're a child of his. Amen? And I think you'll find it interesting, like I did, and I do, that Jesus is at this banquet and he's watching the, the banquetee's behavior. And he's drawn a conclusion about people's hearts, isn't he? Just from the way they're behaving. The way they're behaving at a banquet, and he's commending to them the practice of humility even at the way that they behave at the banquet. And again, this tells me that Jesus cares about every aspect of your life. Even the way you behave, even the way you act, even the way you think, even at a dinner. Yeah. Now, it's interesting that, that in this passage in Luke's Gospel, Jesus doesn't say that it doesn't say that Jesus was more holier than all these guys. And he, you know, not even to go to a banquet. Goodness gracious, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where do we see Jesus a lot of times? He's at a banquet. He's at a party. He's at a dinner. But even there, at these events, he's thinking about what is most important. And he's looking at how people behave. And he's exhorting these people who are jockeying. I, I like that word. I know some words say uh, positioning. I like jockeying. Because it, it's like they're a, a person that just bounces around. Jockeying themselves and positioning themselves, he says, to be humble. Why should I be humble? Well, what's the opposite of humble? Pride. We all know the verse that says pride goes before the fall. But here's something else, beloved. If you have pride in who you are or who you think you are, that pride is something that can keep you from the banquet that our Lord God is going to give at the end of times. Well, I will be at that banquet because I, and I should be there because I, and I'm going to be there because I've done, and I've said, and I've given, and I've, a lot of eyes in there. That's pride. That's pride. And he exhorts his disciples specifically to develop and practice, and if you are a disciple of his, he's exhorting you and I to develop and practice habits of humility. Even in the context of 
a dinner. Be a little humble. Be a little considerate. You can go into restaurants right here in St. Genevieve. And if you're in a line, or maybe you're at a restaurant where a waitress comes to you, and she's going to take your order, what do most people say? I want. I'll have. as if it's expected. What about if we said, may I have? Don't say could I have, because you could. But may I have? May I have a glass of water? That waitress, or that waiter is going to look at you and think in their head, what is up with him? Because that's not normal. But see, that's what a Christian would do. We will be humble. You take this chair. I don't need it. Go ahead, you sit here. I'll sit back there. Jesus is exhorting these guests who are clearly jockeying themselves in places of honor to be humble and knowingly practice habits of humility again even in the context of a dinner and why is Jesus saying that he's saying that because his disciples are characterized by humility you look at the 12 oh let's forget Judas Iscariot okay he punted but look at the other 11 not a brainiac in the group right not anybody really of wealth. They were all humble men with humble jobs. And because they were humble men with humble jo jobs, God could use them. He can use them more than he could some high and fluting guy. Because that person has more pride in themselves because I've achieved. If you know me for any amount of time, you know that one of the men that I like to quote is J.C. Riles. And I like what Riles says about this passage. And please hang in because it's kind of a long quote, but it's so worth it. Riles says, and I quote, humility may well be called the queen of the Christian grace. To know our own sinfulness and weakness and to feel our need for Christ is the very beginning of saving religion. It is grace which has always been the distinguishing feature in the character of every true Christian. All do not have time and opportunity for working directly for Christ. All do not have gifts of speech or tact or knowledge in order to do great good in this world. But all converted people should labor to adorn the doctrine they possess by humility. If they can do nothing else, they can strive to be humble. Then Riles makes a very pointed question. What is the root and spring of humility? Where does humility come from? How do you get humble? He says, here's the answer. One word describes it. The root of humility is knowledge. Right knowledge, the man who really knows himself in his own heart, who knows God in his infinite majesty and holiness, who knows Christ and the price at which he was redeemed that man will never be a proud man. He will count himself like Jacob, unworthy of the least of all God's mercies. He will say of himself like Job, I am vile. He will cry like Paul, I am a chief of sinners. 
He will think anything good enough of himself in lowliness of mind. He will esteem everyone else as better than himself. Ignorance, nothing but sheer ignorance, ignorance of self, of God, of Christ, that is the real secret of pride. From that miserable self-ignorance, may we daily pray to be delivered. He is the wise man who knows himself and who knows himself will find nothing within him to be proud of. End of quote. Jesus in our passage actually reminds us of this because in the passage at the end, it's clear that one of the points that Jesus is making is that we're, whereas the righteous people of Israel have rejected him, okay, the Gentiles will receive him and he groups the Gentiles into those groups, the crippled, the lame, and the poor. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, beloved, guess what group you're in? You and I, we are the crippled, the lame, the blind, the poor, those who are out on the hedges. That's us. We are not one who got the original invitation to the banquet. And our attitude to being at that banquet, banquet is simply... How in the world did I get on the guest list? Because I'm among the crippled, the lame, the poor, and the blind. Beloved, that's the attitude of a true believer. And Jesus is speaking to, to that in the passages of verses 11 through 7, uh, 7 through 11. Number two, Jesus wants his disciples, not just the originals, to be unselfish and generous. Now, having addressed the guests who were jockeying for position, Jesus now speaks to the host of the banquet, you know, the guy who invited him. And in verse 12... It says this. And he also went on to say to the one who invited him. That's the host. When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite, invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return. And that will be your repayment. Now, Jesus had just said something very challenging to the guests, didn't he? Now he's looking at this guy. And really, and I'm going to say this and I'm going to explain it, he begins to critique the guest list. Now, critiquing is not bad. Okay? When I was in high school, many, 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 I could add a couple more minis, years ago, I took speech. And we would get up before the class and we would give a speech on different stuff, different things, different topics. And the students were to be listening, not sleeping in class, but listening. And then my dear speech teacher, Miss Baxter, would say, it's time to critique. And you had to stand there. And you had to smile as these people said something about your speech. And they weren't saying it to be mean. They weren't saying it to be harsh. They were saying it to be helpful, I hope. Because they knew they were going to be up there. And you always wanted to be the first one. Because you always remember, okay, <laughs> when this one gets up here, you wait. So critiquing the list here, Jesus, he's not being harsh or hateful or mean 
But oh my goodness, can you imagine what, what conversation happened when he said this to this guy? Let's put it in today's example, okay? You're sitting around a table. I'll say ladies because I don't know why, but it, it's just the way the comment, my thinking went. You're sitting around a table with your friends and your friend's daughter is there along with some of your other friends. And, and you're at a little luncheon or whatever. And let's say your friend's daughter is getting, going to get married soon. And they pull out a list of the guests to the wedding and to the reception. And they start naming them off. But we're going to invite this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And you say, you know, you really shouldn't invite your rich friends. Who will only one day invite you to their daughter's wedding and reception. You know, have you ever gotten an invitation to a wedding? And then if you have a daughter or a son and they get married, you go, oh, I gotta remember, yeah, they invited us, so we gotta invite them. You know, it's that payback thing. And you look at them and you go, you know, you already, you already invite somebody that, well, they got kids, yeah, but if they get married, they're probably gonna go before a justice of the peace. Or they're gonna go to the local minister who they know and they're not going to have a big wedding and a big reception. You aren't invite those who are unable to invite you to their dinner. Can you imagine the awkward silence? That's what happened here in Luke 14. Okay? That's exactly the awkward moment that we read about here. Jesus is saying to this man who has invited him, imagine that, to this very nice banquet. You know, next time you, next time you have a banquet, don't invite your rich and well-known buddies. Invite some smelly outcast. Or maybe they're not smelly. Maybe they just can't afford to have a big banquet and invite you. Now, one of the things that Jesus isn't saying, he's not saying that you can't invite your friends or family to a party. You know, good grief. But he is emphasizing the importance to his disciples of taking care of those who are sometimes overlooked at events. Because here's what happened. Jesus spotted in the host an attitude, something that was self-serving. In other words, his guest list indicated that one of the things that the host wanted to get out of this banquet was maybe probably some wheeling and dealing. Oh, if I invite this one, hey, he's got the, he's got the cabinet business. You know, maybe I can get a new cabinet for the wife or whatever. He either wanted to get a more status or better position because he was throwing this really good dinner party or he wanted an invitation to a really good dinner party himself. That's at least part of what's at his heart. And either one of these wants or maybe both wants were clear by the invitation list. And our Lord is saying to his disciples, you should look at the people and don't ask, what can I get out of them? But what is my opportunity to give in this situation that couldn't be given back to me? And Christ is stressing that in this passage, is he not? And it's for all of us. While we read these scriptures. Did you notice down in verse 12? He says, you invited them that they may also invite you. There it is. In return. Now, if he would have stopped there and if Luke would have put a period there, we would have thought, okay. 
But there's no period there, is there? He says, that will be your repayment. You got your points. And that's it. But when you give a banquet, invite those who cannot repay you. And here's the line. Let God repay you. Bless those who can't repay you. It's an exhortation for Jesus' disciples to care for those who cannot repay them. But now I'm going to get personal. Repay us. Jesus is indicating here the kind of unselfish concern and generous care for his followers who show to those who are disadvantaged, maybe physically impaired or, or economically impaired. I'm going back to J.C. Riles. I want to quote him about what Riles says about this passage. He says, It is certain that our Lord does not mean by this parable to forbid us from showing any hospitality to relatives or friends. It doesn't mean that people of means must be permanently written off of our guest list or invitations. No, he's not saying that. But we must not forget that this passage contains a deep, important lesson. And we must be careful that we do not limit or, or and qualify that lesson until we have pared it down and refined it into nothing at all. The lesson of the passage is plain, Ryle says, and it's direct. The Lord Jesus would have us care for the poor brethren and help them according to our power. And he would have us know that it is a solemn duty never to neglect the poor. But to aid them and to relieve them of their time of need. End of quote. Number three on your outline. Jesus wants his disciples to care more about him than they care about this world. Maybe we could say he wants his disciples to be countercultural. Remember that awkward exhortation at the banquet apparently led someone there to say in verse 15, just to break the silence with these words, and let's look at verse 15. Then one of those who were reclining at the table with him, and notice the him is capitalized, meaning Jesus, heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. That, that, that statement, beloved, it, it, it's a play on words to downplay the radical things that Jesus had just said about the crippled and the lame and the blind and the poor. It's almost like this guy says, yeah, Jesus, it's wonderful that, you know, you invite the crippled, the lame, the blind, the poor to a banquet, but man, aren't we all blessed? Because in the Jewish mindset, if you were crippled, blind, lame, and poor, you weren't blessed. You were cursed. And if you were healthy, wealthy, and wise, you were then blessed. But he's saying, isn't everybody blessed? And it's almost as if Jesus says, yeah, friend. But let's think about who's going to be on that invitation list. Because, and it may surprise you who's on there and who's not on there. I think sometimes we're going to get to heaven and we're going to go, oh my goodness. You're here? And they're going to turn around and look at us and go, I can't believe you're here. <laughs> I know there are some people that's going to do that to me when I get there.
who's there and who's not there at the banquet at the end of times. And we see that in verses 16 to 24. Now, in those verses, Jesus begins to describe a typical Jewish invitation, either to a wedding feast or a party or, 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 or a banquet. There's two kinds of invitations at this time period that would be sent out. The first would have been an invitation that would be sent out and it would indicate a date and time which a banquet was going to be given. We've all got those. Okay? But then a second invitation would be sent out on the day of the banquet that was going to happen. And that invitation would be delivered personally. That's that slave. They would go out and go to the person and say, hey, the banquet is that you got that card from, that it, it's going to be on this date at this time, it's now. Come now. Now, more than likely, the guest, even in Jesus' day, when he walked this earth, they would have already indicated that they were coming to the banquet by sending some form of RSVP. Okay? And on the day of the banquet, the servant, again, he goes out and he delivers this verbal, direct, second invitation to the people that, hey, the banquet's, you know, it's now, it's time to go. But in our text, the encounter, all of these people had been given the original invitation, started making excuses as to why they couldn't come. Now, if you look at the excuses, there's not a one of them that's bad. Not a one. In reality, they're good. One guy said, I bought a field and I need to go out and look at it. Well, that's being a smart businessman. The other one said, I bought some new oxen. Now, you should have looked at them before you bought them. But that's okay. You know, if you took the word off of somebody, now you go out and do it. And this other guy, I just... I. I I just married my wife. Okay. But they're good. But they're excuses nonetheless, right? For not coming to the banquet. Now that, that's, that's at number three point. And then I'm going to shift. And I'm going to say, I'm going to close with this. What is Jesus saying about the excuses? Jesus saying that, that over concern with the things of this world. Even though they may be good things, like these people in the parable, and over concerned of the world, even with people today who may be listening to this message, who are all caught up in the things that we think are so very important. The car, the house, our families, our whatever. They're important, and there's nothing bad about them. But beloved, listen, if you put them, those things, before God, you're going to miss the claims of God. You're not only going to miss the claims of God, you're going to miss the kingdom of God. And not only are you going to miss the claims of God and the kingdom of God, you're going to miss the banquet of God at the end of times. Because God has to be number one. Amen? Over your house, over your cars, over your... If you got animals, even though warm, fuzzy little puppy dogs and kitty cats, which I'll exclude. But anyway, kitty cats, bunny rabbits, whatever even your children, even your spouse. Because, beloved, if you love God first, you'll love your spouse the way God wants you to love your spouse. If you love God first, you will love your children the way God wants you to love your children. If you love God first, children, you will love your parents the way God wants you to love them and not be a royal pain in the neck to them. 
had to say that. Because if you love other things more than God, I will be willing to say that God is not your God. And if God is not your God, then Jesus is not your Savior. And if God is not your God and Jesus is not your Savior, then you're not a believer. In a nutshell, what Jesus is saying in this passage is don't miss the end time banquets. End time banquet for other people or other things. Put him first. And you can only do that through God's gracious mercy and his faith that he gives us to accept him as Lord and Savior. And the only way that we can accept him as Lord and Savior is to repent of our sins. To admit that we're a, a sinner and that we don't deserve salvation. And to believe that God sent his precious, holy, sinless son down to this earth to live in the swallow and mud pies of a, the world and he did it without sinning and he went to the cross and he died on that cross. He was buried and as the scripture says, he rose on the third day, but the scriptures continue to say that he ascended into heaven. And the only way you can be a, a Christian is if you repent of those sins. It's the only way. I read this statement and I paraphrased it and I, or I redirected it because I wanted it to fit us. From Athens to St. Genevieve. From the first century to the 21st century and everywhere in between. While repentance may not be popular, it is still the gospel. And if you are going to be saved, beloved, you need to repent of your sins and turn to Christ and him alone for your salvation. Because in him, or in, in, in Christ, there, he's the only salvation. There's salvation in no other. Let's go to the Lord. Father, I pray this morning that you will wake us up and that you will draw us to yourself. Maybe for the first time. Maybe someone doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. And if you're drawing them, Father God, I pray that they cry out to you and admit that they are a sinner. And they have done wrong. And they believe all the claims of who Jesus Christ proclaims himself to be. The very son of God. The only way of salvation. And that they will confess you as Lord and Savior. And Father, for those who have already done that, draw us to you closer that we will walk in a way that's worthy of you, that we will give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory that you deserve. Father, I pray that you help us to be men and women of God. In Jesus' name, amen.